Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for human factors, psychology, and design. Hey, what's going on, everybody? It is episode 218. We're recording this live on September 9th, 2021, and this is Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome. I'm joined today by Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Hey, Nick. How you doing? Hey, man. I am good. We got a great show for you all tonight. We'll be talking about what happens to us when we age. But first, uh, we got some programming notes here and a, a little community update, if you will. Um, hey, uh, we're, we're going to the Neuroergonomics Conference next week. Uh, that's September 11th through the 16th. We've been invited. And we've uh, actually got a couple of, uh, what, what do you want to call them, tickets or admissions to give away on the show tonight. Yeah. Um, you'll have coverage from that event. We'll be there. Uh, and so will a couple of you. And we want to uh, let you all know who those winners are right now. So the winners have been notified via email. Uh, but we have Kirsten M. from the United States. We have uh, Vianney, from, uh, Vianney R. from Singapore. And then we also have uh, Bo D from the Netherlands. So we have a worldwide, we have people all over the world winning these giveaways. Worldwide so, um, audience of winners. That's amazing. Yeah, it's it's pretty awesome. So congratulations to our winners. We're excited to see you all there. And for the rest of you who aren't able to go, uh, like I said, we'll have coverage from that event. And there's some pretty cool keynotes and presentations that I'm looking forward to. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll try to have that coverage for you. Uh, also, if you're unaware, if you like the conference coverage, um, we did put out some conference coverage this weekend from UXPA. I sat down with uh, Christy Harper from end to end user research. We actually sat down and talked about UXPA International. Uh, so that is out there for your ear holes now. Uh, please go listen to it. And one more little programming note here. Uh, our humanoid robots uh, deep dive is live now. So you can go check that out. It's a great companion piece to last week's episode where we talked about the Tesla bots. But we know why you are all here. You are here for Human Factors News. So let's go ahead and get into the thing. That's right. This is the part of the show all about Human Factors News. We search all over the internet. We look for the news stories. I pick and choose. Then the patrons pick and choose. And then it comes to you. Uh, this week, you know, Blake, we're talking a lot about what happens when we age. Everyone kind of wonders about it. We're all getting older. What happens when we age? Blake, what, what's this new story this week? It might surprise you, Nick. So it's been long believed that advanced, advancing age leads to broad declines in our mental abilities. But now new research from the University of Georgetown Medical Center offers surprisingly good news by countering this view. So the findings in Nature Human Behavior, published earlier this year, show that two key brain functions, which allow us to attend to new information and to focus on what's in a given situation, can in fact improve in older individuals. These functions underlie our critical aspects of co cognition, such as memory, decision making, self-control, navigation, our ability to do math, to talk, and even reading. And a quote from some of the authors, so people widely believed and assumed that attention and executive functions decline with age. And despite intriguing hints from some of the smaller scale studies that raise questions about these assumptions, the results from large scale studies done by this group have indicated that critical elements of abilities can be improved during aging, likely because we simply get practice with these skills throughout our entire span of life. So Nick, this is kind of insane for two reasons so i feel like this is the one of the first times that we've talked about aging on the show which we know is a big human factors topic uh but also this is one of those paradigm shifting moments that science can so often provide where it's like well maybe some cognitive abilities decline but not everything so i don't know what do you think man yes great point so uh really quick before i get into my thoughts i want to get into social thoughts here so we asked you all uh, tonight's story is about aging and how some key abilities may actually improve as we age. Our question to you was, should we require cognitive tests as we age for risky activities? So things like driving a car or operating heavy machinery. Uh, and then we also asked you to comment with what you think are the most essential cognitive skills we should have as we age. Um, so 
we got some answers from you all. We'll we'll be able to uh, uh, sprinkle those throughout. I do want to just start with the <laughs> the poll here. We asked a poll question, which was the you know should we require cognitive tests as we age uh, for risky activities? Uh, overwhelmingly, yes. Um, in fact, it was one hundred percent yes on Twitter. It was one hundred percent yes on Instagram. So, um, you know, take that as you will. We need we need more testing for older individuals. And is it a matter of trust? I don't know. We'll get into it and we'll talk about some of these aging effects and whether or not it, it truly uh, they truly should be tested on on certain things. Right. So um, getting into my reaction to the article. I I, I was surprised. You know, I, I looked at this and, uh, you know, and I think a lot of people are surprised. Uh, because you, <laughs> you think about cognitive decline in elderly individuals, and it's um, it's sad a lot of the times when you can see the the gears slowing down um, from the outside. And you know, there's it, we we understand there's a lot of different aspects that go into cognitive function, and we'll break some of those down here, and kind of which ones decline, which ones don't, or you know, which ones improve according to this study. Um, but yeah, it's, it's sad to watch that from the outside. And, um, I guess my, my initial reaction was this is good <laughs> because like you said, it's a paradigm shift, right? If we, if we can think about, uh, aging differently, if we can start to, um, cater to these, uh, these types of functions that we're going to talk about in just a moment, then perhaps we may be able to prolong the cognitive decline and it will happen over many more years rather than. A, a rapid decline that you see so many times. Uh, but Blake, I, I'm interested in what's, what's your reaction to this? So one thing that I feel like I've listened to a lot over the past, probably two to five years is a lot about aging science and what we can do to, you know, prepare ourselves for aging or Im impacted and kind of change the course that we end up going down, whether it's cognitive decline, having your more physical readiness, like for longer in life or whatever it may be from various people like Dr. Peter Tier, Dr. Avi de Gray, really looking at science of how people age and what can be do, done to kind of mitigate it and prolong life, I guess. But this is interesting because it actually shows that even without some of those mitigation strategies that are kind of being developed, like new science, if you will, that may not be accessible to everybody, it looks like some to some degree the human brain looks as if it's able to handle aging for certain functions. So although we know we get a little bit of cognitive decline in certain areas, it is awesome to see that we actually can improve in in our age when we also may not even, you know, see a giant decline in every area of cognition. Um, so I think it's an awesome article and I'm glad that the, the key point I saw in the blurb in this article is that really this was picked up from a trend of smaller studies. And like, it was only because like, certain scientists across a couple of different universities were really interested in this idea that they were seeing in really small sample sizes that we can actually get some aspects of cognition to stay at baseline or increase um, that we are able to see this large scale study come from Georgetown. So I, I don't know, just awesome all around, really. Yeah, we'll get into exactly what declined and what stayed the same. But I do want to kind of take a survey of what, uh, you know, what cognitive functions have been found in, in previous literature, right? So we have two articles here that we're, uh, we'll, we'll link them in the show notes here, but we have Harada et al., which is a 2013 paper. So it's a little older, but still um, provides a pretty good overview of, uh, you know, the different mental functions and and what uh, stays or what declines and when. Um, and those are uh, mostly echoed by Correa, uh, Correria, Correria at all. That's in 2018. Um, and then we'll get into, I think, uh, you know, this study and, and talk about what changes, right? So just generally, um, I think we, we talk about, uh, intelligence or, um, cognitive function. Uh, this is taking you back to the, uh, <laughs> cog psych 101 or what, you know, crystallized versus fluid intelligence, right? So you have this <laughs> crystallized intelligence, which is something like skills, ability, knowledge, um, that is learned, uh, practiced and familiar. And you have this fluid cognition, which is a person's sort of ability to process and learn new information, solve problems and attend to and manipulate one's environment. Right. So these are these are key concepts that like, I don't know, Blake, you mentioned before the show, you haven't revisited these in, since you were in school and myself neither. Right. So it's a good refresher for us. Um, 
but we have several different kind of uh, cognitive abilities, if you will, things like processing speed attention. Um, so I figure, you know, we go break these down and then uh, we'll talk about how they change. Right. So um, and, and Blake, jump in here if you have anything to add. But we'll start with processing speed, right? So processing speed begins to decline in the third decade of life and continues throughout the lifespan. Um, you know, attention, you have a more noticeable age effect is seen on more complex attention tasks, such as selective and divided attention. Uh, so older adults are performing worse than younger adults on tasks involving working memory. Which I think might be something that, that a lot of us maybe can relate to if we've had grandparents or we've experienced kind of maybe cognitive decline where you've got, you know, I don't know about you, but I remember my grandmother, she had great attention to detail and memory for things that happened a long time ago, but it started like in the working memory things like day-to-day -day tasks and stuff like that, forgetting what she was doing or whatever it means. So, I mean, that kind of follows suit with what we know from the broader literature of attention and then how it impacts aging. Yeah. And let's talk about memory. Um, so, you know, as a group, older adults do not perform as well as younger adults on a variety of learning and memory tests. Uh, you know, you have declarative and non-declarative memory, right? Where declarative is like this explicit memory, uh, recollection of facts, events. And then you have um, you have non-declarative, which is, uh, you know, kind of outside of a person's awareness. They're thinking about like how to sing a song or, um, you know procedural memory where you know you're you're looking for uh motor and cognitive skills so it's not the facts that you're reciting but it's more like muscle memory um and if you if you think about memory and aging there's uh there's a couple things that happen here it's a there's a whole table and this is from the harada et al paper um so you have just things we'll we'll go over things that decline with age and then we'll talk about things that remain stable with age so um you know, as as you age, you have sort of this de delayed free recall. So you're unable to record uh, uh, spontaneously recall that information um, without a cue. You also have, uh, you know, source memory. So knowing the source of a learned information. Right. So remember, if you heard this fact from, um, uh, I don't know, fresh in my mind. So like a like a Newsmax or or if it's from like a scientific journal. Um, uh, Which or I think makes if, a lot of sense too, right? Because yeah. source memory, you're especially now, it'd be it'll be interesting to see what what it's like when you and I are old if we were able to participate in these studies because of the amount of information now is so insane and the amount that it's coming out of like your your phone and various mediums like trying to remember source of anything can be just super impossible at this stage so i would imagine this gets exacerbated as time goes on for um you know future studies and things like that yeah and then the last one here that declines with age is uh prospective memory so remembering to perform intended actions in the future right so forgetting like to take medicine before you go to bed uh which is actually a huge problem in the healthcare field it's like, how do you communicate directions to um, aging individuals who may have a harder time remembering some of these things? So let's talk about, you know, some of the uh, things that remain stable with age, right? So you have recognition memory. You're able to, um, you know, re we're talking about recognition versus recall in this instance. And so it's going to be easier to uh, recognize something. You know, you see an object that you haven't seen in years and all the memories just come flooding back. That's something that uh, you are able to recognize that doesn't decline with age. Um, you know, the, I always think of the example in Coco uh, where where Grandma Coco sees the picture of her dad and she goes, Papa, and if you want a good cry, <laughs> go watch Coco because, man, I'm just getting teary eyed thinking about it. <sighs> Grandma Coco. All right. Anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll get on with it. Uh, all right. So then we have temporal order memories. So this is thinking of things of like, um, you know, how, how do things happen over time? Correct sequence of events, those types of things. Right. So like remembering last Saturday that you went to the grocery store after you were able to uh, after you went and ate lunch with your friends, that type of thing uh, that remains stable with age. And then the last one here, procedural memory. So this is how to, you know, how to do things, how to ride a bike. Um, so that's kind of an interesting table of how memory can ch uh, can decline or remain stable with age. And then, um, you know, we have a couple other, again, we're still in the Harada et al. paper here. They go over language, 
visual spatial abilities and construction and executive functioning. So let's talk about those. Uh, language ability remains intact with aging. Just overall. Uh, for visual spatial abilities and construction. So this is like uh, the ability to put together individual parts to make a coherent whole. So like, you know, assembling Ikea furniture, um, you know, that that declines over time. And then um, is, you, this is kind of interesting because this is almost a little bit um, contrary to what the paper that we are talking well, about Georgetown finds in some ways. Well, that's why we're talking about this first, Blake. That's why we're talking about this first. Yeah. And then uh, the last one here, executive functioning. So, um, you know, things like concept formation, abstraction, uh, mental flexibility, those things decline with age, especially after age 70. Um, so I think that was a good recap of the Harada et al. paper. Anything else from that that you'd like to uh, talk about there, Blake? No, I mean, this seems seems probably to go along with a lot of the normative um, stereotypes we'd imagine that come with aging. I mean, a little bit more, obviously, if you're familiar with psychology or if, or if you have a psych background. But this seems all kind of steady state normal of what you would expect. Um, which we'll find a little bit more about later as we go back to the original paper or the new paper for the evening. Yeah, let's let's get into a social thought here. So again, the question was, should we, or sorry, the question was, uh, what do you think are essential cognitive skills as we age? Uh, we have anonymous from Instagram. They asked to be remain anonymous. This is uh, being aware of our surroundings. So this is something that they thought was critical to aging. Um, you know, the the folks uh, who. It's, it's sad. The, the people who have dementia, who don't know where they are. Uh, so I'm, I'm guessing that's what they're talking about here. Um, and then uh, we have one more from Instagram that we'll read right now. So this is from Erica Marie. This is our, our graphic artist. She's the one who made the logo. Uh, so this is conceptual processing speed. Um, so how quickly it takes to understand a new or novel idea. So she thinks that one is kind of the most important thing as we age. We'll get to more social thoughts in just a moment. Um, but I do want to talk briefly about this other paper here that we have, the Cor Correria et al. 2018. They echo a lot of the same things that was found in the 2013 article. It's just a little bit more recent. Um, you know, and so we wanted to bring that up. I think there's, there's kind of one uh, point that the other article... Um, mentions, you know, decreased cognitive processing speed is a widely accepted finding and usually related to the changes in the brain, um, the white matter that that take place in the aging process. So I think that's kind of the thing we want to highlight with that one. Um, now, why don't we get into this one? Blake, you want to break down the, the different, um, what's the word I'm looking for, components here that they studied? Yeah. So for the original study, they really focused on three main components of cognition. So they're really focusing on what how your brain kind of processes of information at multiple different levels, focusing first on alerting, orienting yourself to the world, and then just what they call executive inhibition or executive function, being able to calm down those different ideas. So what I'll do is I'm actually going to break apart those three, just so we have some good operational definitions to walk through as we go through the rest of the kind of concepts and what they found overall. So when we talk about alerting, we're really trying to characterize this as a state of enhanced vigilance and being prepared in order to respond to incoming information. So being able to react to stuff in your environment, such as like when we're driving. Um, another one uh, that is focused on orienting. So this really involves shifting your attention to different resources in terms of spatial location. So really being able to understand your surroundings, interpret them correctly, and kind of interact with your surroundings in a way that's, you know, meaningful for you. And the last one, which is really focused on executive function. So they use this in terms of the executive network. So executive network inhibits distracting or conflicting information, allowing us to focus on one, what's important. So you can imagine being in a crowded room, being able to focus on somebody that you're having a conversation with and tune out the noise around you um, and really kind of hone in on whatever's being said. Uh, so those are our main key components that we're looking at in terms of understanding how in aging populations, uh, people process information. Uh, so high level, Dick, the study's really big main takeaway is that only alerting, so going back to how, how we're able to deal with new information and being prepared to react to it, that's a space that really we see a decline with age in. 
However, in terms of orienting or executive inhibition, we can see either them staying at baseline or even being able to be improved as we age, um, which is kind of a, an interesting set of findings there. So do we want to give our thoughts on the overall thesis of what they've got going on or do we want to kind of keep going through? Yeah, I mean, let's give our overall thoughts, right? Like I, I to me, uh, orienting was a little surprising, especially, you know, given the example that I just gave, right? If you have somebody with dementia who doesn't know where they are, what's going on. That's what I think of when I think of like lost old people. Um, sorry, lost aging populations. Uh, and so like, you know, it's it was surprising to me. Um, and I think the the finding about you know being able to inhibit distracting information uh is is interesting as well because you know when you uh, when i think about aging populations i think about maybe hard of hearing and that's that's biological things going on inside their ears you know and so to me the fact that they um either remain the same or even improve their ability to uh cut through the noise and to focus in on something is uh is interesting to me I, what are your kind of overall thoughts on this? The, the the whole thing about orienting and then executive function or being able to basically inhibit things and focus in on details. I think for those two, I am very surprised that they can even improve with aging because of things that you just said. But I think maybe the important part to think about here in terms of like studying this is all things considered normal outside of like having, you know, some kind of neurodegenerative disease or having any kind of biological effects of potential aging, like hearing loss and things like that. Um, the, the orienting does surprise me because maybe, maybe because I'm biased because my own spatial abilities are very bad. Um, <laughs> and it's, it so it just surprises me. The executive function thing. I think that that's one of these areas and they, they talk a little bit about this in the paper, of the ability to basically practice something continually and it build like a skill over time. I feel like a lot of times we're, we're forced to do that in various capacities, whether it was at school or, you know, working in a noisy environment or whatever it may be. So although like, like you said, some biological markers may make it hard, make, make it for harder for people to hear the focal attention is still probably pretty good. Cause we've had a lot of practice with doing that. Alerting in some ways doesn't surprise me now that we've gone through those other papers kind of like thoughts and they broke down all those pieces because really it's like this new brand new incoming information that could be novel that one I have to figure out, understand, and then all of a sudden react to in some cases. Um, so that one, I guess it makes some intuitive sense that it would decline with age because it's there's just a lot of different variables that you have to potentially figure out and then react to. Um, but overall, it's it's still interesting that you can see that not everything is cognitively declining just because you get a little bit older. Yeah, I want to get into alerting really quick here, because I, I mean, if you think about it, aging populations have been around for a while. And so they've experienced novel things time and time again. However, as you age, you experience less and less novel things as time goes on. And so I'm wondering if it's like a muscle that you have to work to react to new things. And because they're they've seen so much by that point in their life that, you know, they're not exercising that muscle as much. And so they can't sort of uh, understand what's going on. Right. We'll get into what the researchers think here is the reason. Uh, I do want to get into another social thought here. Um, let's see here. This one's actually from our, our buddy, Barry Kirby, who's uh, actually one of the latest members of the Digital Media Lab. If you're interested, uh, we, <laughs> we have that link on our website. Uh, Barry writes, the ability for dynamic decision making must be key. And that research indicates that alerting is negatively impacted. But is this where automation can help, especially in more rural suburban areas where vehicles are more of a necessity than a luxury? So uh, this is in respect to the uh, risky activities and decision making uh, cognitive skills. So I don't know, Blake, what do you think? Do you think uh, automation can help with some of these, you know, declining mental abilities as you age? I think it can help. I don't know that it's going to help us overcome some of the issues like, you know, losing attentional, uh, like alerting cap or capability to react to alerting. Because if you think about it, like if we're you know, offloading things to automation more and more earlier and earlier in life, we may not be experiencing as many kind of novel things, I guess. Uh, but I definitely think it makes a lot of sense to try and go ahead and start thinking about 
what technology solutions we can start putting in place if we understand a lot of the variables of what aging looks like, how it affects cognition, what can be done from, you know, an automation standpoint or a supplementary standpoint, like BCIs when you're older. I can imagine almost, I don't know, this feels science, science fiction and futuristic, but down the line, being able to use a BCI to help you kind of, you know, give yourself more RAM, if you will, um, for <laughs> offloading things or whatever it may be, or even reminding things that you need to do. Right. Uh, but yeah, so that's a great thought. And I think dynamic decision making is one of those key areas that you want to kind of have facility of throughout your entire life. Yeah. I'm going to read one more social thought. This one comes from our Twitch, Kristen and Twitch. Do you think the tech boom influenced younger people's ability to focus attention? And that's why the aging population is better. Uh, Blake, what are your thoughts on, on the tech boom influencing younger people's ability to focus attention? I definitely think it's going to play a big role. That was something I was alluding to a, a little bit earlier, like what it's going to be like for you and I, when we hit this age and how it's going to impact our ability to, you know, still be as see these kind of cognitive benefits, I think we're going to see them in a different way. Um, but I, I still think that alerting is still going to be an issue because of brand new stimuli. Although you could argue that we do expose ourselves to a lot of potentially novel things all the time in term from an information perspective. Uh, but yeah, I think it's going to have a big impact on our ability to hold attention for long periods of time, which may impact these other two things we're seeing positive growth in, in a different fashion. How about you, Nick? I mean, do you think that our interaction with technology or our, our oversaturation with technology really is going to impact our attentional abilities or our cognition when we're old? I think so, but I, I, I think it's going to have the opposite effect. Uh, I think it's, it's actually going to worsen our attentive abilities, uh, if only because things are designed uh, be it content or uh, otherwise usability even to get everything very quickly. And so, you know, there's this attention, uh, these, these short attention span things need like everything designed for a short attention span, which, you know, in, in usability or content wise, it's, it makes sense, right? You want to capture everybody's attention. You want to get across the point very quickly because everyone's time is valuable. I think that uh, over time will have some large effect on our ability to, um, you know, uh, process distracting, conflicting information or, you know, focus on what's important if only because one, we're, we're kind of seeing this, uh, that there's so much information out there. Some of it's factual. Some of it is not. Um, and people are picking and choosing what they consume. Um, and so, you know, if you start from a bad place with, you know, <laughs> bad information, then how do you, how do you parse through that information and discern what's correct? You know, it's, it's, you're living in your own reality at that point. I don't know. Uh, and then, you know, orienting, I think that might actually strengthen with the short attention span thing. That's that's kind of my thoughts on the whole um, technology influencing our our attention focus. Uh, I don't know. I, it's it's an interesting question um, and ripe for researchers to <laughs> to figure out over time, right? Uh, do we do we want to get into the why? I want to get into the why. You want to break it down for us, Blake? Why is yeah. why are these things happening? So just to reiterate, so. Researchers found that we're seeing a, a decline in alerting understanding, but we're seeing potentially an increase in both orienting and executive inhibition. So why are we seeing this? Well, researchers hypothesized based off the studies they had conducted that because orienting and inhibition are simply skills that allow people to selectively attend to objects, these skills can improve with lifelong practice, which is kind of intuitive in some ways, right? You get very familiar with doing a specific thing. You can focus attention to it over longer periods of time, you know, being in an entire lifetime. So those skills are kind of in some ways, very, very strong. Um, but in the contrast with alerting, like Nick had kind of alluded to, um, alerting declines in a lot of ways, because this basic state of vigilance and preparedness, we really can't practice that a whole lot. Um, it, the I think there's a very small people, small amount of people that actually ever practice, you know, dealing with alerting situations. Um, seals come to mind is the only population I can think of that would 
be practicing with that kind of stuff or going through, you know, significant training related to specifically just different situations or alerts. But that's, that's kind of a, again, in line with the ability, the thing that you can, whatever you can practice in real life or do consistently over and over makes sense that you would be able to maybe be able to pay attention to that as long as you don't have neuro degenerative diseases or any kind of extra things going on. Um, and you could strengthen that through life, depending on how often you're doing these things or learning new stuff. Yeah, I think it, it makes sense when you when you think about the practice that we get from um, some of these other things. And and when you break it down, you're, you're right. We're not doing a whole lot of that alerting or, uh, you know, vigilance preparedness to respond to incoming information all the time. I think uh, it makes sense. Like you said, you know, we're, we're not practicing that type of information. And so the, the practice makes perfect and in fact can improve, uh, especially if you keep practicing this. And I, I do want to bring up uh, a question from Katie in our discord. Um, it sounds like they're making the case that we might actually be able to mitigate some of these cognitive decline uh, from aging by practicing certain cognitive skills more which is interesting considering there is so much research showing cognitive decline is inevitable. Uh, but could it also be integrated into games or other tools uh, for o older adults, uh, some way to practice cognitive skills that seem influenced by practice? What do you think, Blake? Is there a way to incorporate this type of thing into um, tools used for the uh, aging populations? So I think it, I think Katie brings up a really good point and to make it a little bit more complicated, I think it's a multivariate problem. Like it's not just going to be related to what cognitive things can we do? I think there's a lot about understanding brain health and understanding, you know, personal biology that's going to play into it over time. And there's plenty of research about, you know, impacts of supplementation or various, you know, different styles of diet or what you do in your physical life that can impact your brain health as well. And then on top of that, it depends on how much you're actually putting in, you know, effort cognitively. But one thing that came to mind from the alerting perspective while you were talking is I wonder if people that do play video games that are often you end you up in situations that you can't really predict uh, if that could have any positive benefit to the alerting, you know, retention, if you will. But I, I do think there's got to be ways like Katie's alluding to, to, you know, build either games or activities that you can do as a group that continue to strengthen these different skills, especially the ones that we know as of right now, you can have some improve improvement in for sure. Yeah. And, and you brought up a great point. Like how does, how do self-identified gamers, uh, you know, how, how are they impacted by this? Right. Because you are responding to novel situations in a lot of times in those games that become sort of practiced situations over time. But, uh, I do want to mention Barry, uh, also wrote back to Katie on this, a lot of elderly, particularly those with dementia are encouraged to do Sudoku's, which does fit with that finding and that it's a specific set of cognitive skills for that type of puzzle. So it is being uh, recommended uh, for, you know, aging populations who are experiencing certain, um, what's the word I'm looking for, afflictions. Uh, so it'd be interesting to see how that changes over time. Um, any other closing thoughts on this one, Blake? I know we, we got to get out of here uh, to the next part of the show. Yeah. So one thing I do want to wrap with is kind of like the so what factor to this whole re set of research. So from the researchers' perspectives, the findings really not only change the, the general view about how aging affects your mind, but also could lead to clinical improvements, including for patients that have aging disorders like Alzheimer's. If you can catch things early on or develop like personalized programs, depending on somebody's brain health early in life, you may be able to either mitigate or potentially in the future avoid some of these neurodegenerative diseases we see today. Great save. I almost forgot that part. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, huge thank you to our patrons this week for selecting our topic. And thank you to our friends over at Georgetown University Medical Center for our news story this week. If you want to follow along, uh, join me on Office Hours every Monday night where I find these news stories. We do post the links to our original articles on our weekly roundups on our blog. And also join us on Slack or Discord for more discussion on these stories. We're going to take a quick break. And then we're going to be back to see what's going on in the Human Factors community right after this. Human Factors Cast brings you the best in Human Factors news, interviews, conference coverage, and overall fun conversations into each and every episode we produce. 
but we can't do it without you. The Human Factors Cast Network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running the show come from our listeners. Our patrons are our priority, and we want to ensure we're giving back to you for supporting us. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like access to our weekly Q&As with the hosts, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Minute, a Patreon-only weekly podcast where the hosts break down unique, obscure, and interesting Human Factors topics in just one minute. Patreon rewards are always evolving, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you, and remember, it depends. Yes, huge thank you as always to our patrons and especially our honorary Human Factors Cast ha, Human Factors Cast staff uh, patron Michelle Tripp. Patrons like you keep the show running. Thank you all so much for your continued support. We're actually going to hear from Michelle in just a minute. Uh, if you want to become a patron, you can do that. There's a lot of ways that you can support the show. There's a uh, what is it? It's a one dollar tier, which gives you access to uh, things like. Um, all all of our content except for human factors minute and then there's you know the next tier over which is uh human factors engineer um anyway we are going to get into this next part of the show we like to call it came from it came from That's right. It came from this week. We got a little bit of everything. We got some from our patrons, we got some from our uh discord and we got some from uh from from the good old reddits um so we look all over the community to bring you topics that you all are talking about uh you know what if these answers are helpful to you give us a like on whatever platform you're on right now and help other people find this content so we're going to read this first one here uh, from one of our patrons michelle tripp uh says hi all my question is about remote ux research the pandemic has definitely caused an increase in remote ux research and testing from both of your experiences, what struggles, trials and errors have you had, if any, or successes with remote testing and research? Is remote research something that you already had experience with before the pandemic started? Thanks for all the hard work you both do for uh, HFC, Michelle. Thanks, Michelle. That's really kind of you. Um, Blake, have you done remote research before the pandemic? And then have you done it during the pandemic? I definitely I'd never done it before pre-pandemic. Uh pandemic of course like a lot of people kind of forced your hand in some ways uh but yeah so definitely a lot of lessons learned on all sides of the house in terms of kind of trials and errors or like the biggest problems the one of the hardest things that i had especially in my previous job was technology problems like literally if somebody was not in you know, not at home using their own equipment and due to kind of work circumstances, they may not be able to share their screen. They may not be able to see the video or they may not even be able to, you know, see a brief or presentation that you're trying to show. So kind of having to buffer and plan for all of those things, being ready for tech not to work and you have to do usability testing on the phone or you have to walk somebody through a design concept without, you know, them maybe even being able to see the design. Uh, there's just a lot of weird things that you have to kind of account for. And sometimes you just end up rescheduling that kind of stuff. Uh, but one thing that really, really helped me was, you know, use it. And I'm, I'm not trying to plug a specific product. I've used a lot of different design tools. But one thing that helped me a lot was Adobe XD because it gave me the capability to send links to my designs that people could interact with on their own machine. I didn't have to rely on, you know, hosting it somewhere or like sending it through different means. It was like just a link. You could click it, you could use it. Um, and that would allow us to walk through designs and maybe we wouldn't get the capability to record somebody's face or whatever, but we could, you know, have them go through tasks and things like that. So for me as a designer, that really was an invaluable tool. Uh, in terms of like really successful moments, one awesome, the, there's one awesome kind of side effect of the pandemic for me is I got more access to end users than I had ever had before um, in, in my previous position, just because it was, it, they would either be home 
so they would be able to, you know, access, you know, whatever we were doing from their own laptop through Microsoft Teams or whatever it may be that we were using. And that also gave us the capability to talk a lot more often. So it just gave a lot of different user engagement throughout. But Nick, correct me if I'm wrong, you've done a lot of remote user testing at this point, right? Yeah. So yeah, let me start before the pandemic because that was part of the question. Um, I did have experience with this pre-pandemic. However, it was a very tricky situation because I had, uh, say I had users that were a very specialized population. So there weren't very many of them. Like we're talking maybe hundreds in the world. Um, and so you can't really get to them that easily. They were also operating in spaces where technology was not allowed. Outside technology was not allowed. So you couldn't email them something very easily without it having to go through a million different things. Um, and, it, it, you know, the technology had to be vetted before it was able to be into be able to be entered into that space. Uh, and they operate in those spaces all day. So, you know, asking them to do it outside that space uh, would be kind of unreasonable because once they're out of that space, they're off the clock. So uh, one way in which we did remote user testing was we had to find a tool that was able to get vetted past all these. It had to go through a million different checks before it went out. Lots of challenges with it. Um, I think like you, Blake, once the pandemic happened, the door kind of blew wide open on being able to access people because everyone was at home. Uh, there's no longer all these checks that need to happen before it goes into a secure space. Um, I will say, you know, when we talk about... Um, my experience during the pandemic of usability testing, there's going to be a difference between complete systems and systems that are under development. And I think that's what you were talking to, Blake, was the ability to interact with people who need to be able to see in-progress designs or be able to interact with interactive prototypes or anything like that. So it sounds like you had some success with Adobe XD in that regard. I was fortunate enough to have a system that existed that needed testing. Uh, and so, you know, they were just operating off of a website that's that's out there now. Um, and so in that regard, that was a huge win for me because <laughs> I didn't have to like set up anything behind the scenes. Now I will say um, we used the Microsoft Office suite. And so it was a lot of setting up uh, the, you know, uh, the, the Microsoft Teams, making it available to anyone. And then we're also dealing with an aging population who's not so savvy with computers. And so uh, it might be a little trickier to have them go through all the steps. So you had to carefully write out the steps for everyone uh, ahead of time. So that way they knew exactly what they do. You click on this button, then you click on this button. Because if you don't click on this button, you'll be waiting in a lobby that's not quite the lobby. And you won't be able to see us. We won't be able to see you. Uh, here's my contact info. If you have any issues, if you don't see us within, you know, a couple seconds of this timestamp, then let us know. So there's a lot of things that needed to happen. Um, and a lot of things that could go wrong that fortunately didn't, because I took a lot of those precautions to like outline every step that they needed to take ahead of time. Uh, I mean, you know, so that's, that's kind of one, um, trial and error. Um, successes were that we were able to capture more than I thought we would. You know, we asked them for permission to record their screen and their face. A lot of them were willing, um, it, you know, which is weird considering, you know, you're on this like new, uh, new frontier of pandemic living where, um, you know, everyone sees your face all the time and some were weird about it and that's okay. We didn't get their data, but, uh, you know, I think, I think largely it's been a success and I think, this will blow the door wide open for future usability tests, uh, you know, across across the world. Being able to access things remotely from your home um, is huge. So I don't know. Any other thoughts on that one, Blake? I think one other kind of aspect of this that was really important for me was kind of like setting expectations with your team on kind of processes that you should go through to, you know, pre pre doing any kind of testing. So, you know, testing it out with each other in your own kind of spaces, because we were afforded that we could, we could test out what it's like to try and do a usability test when we're all in separate spaces and we're using teams in our case or whatever it may be. Also trying to plan ahead of time to send out any kind of material that you can. That was the biggest winner for all of my experiences. Cause it was like, people could, 
most people, because they were at home now, they were reading the materials, unlike any of the in-person things that I was ever doing. <laughs> so they were asking questions via email. And sometimes that would help us catch, you know, maybe some potential technology mistakes that might happen or whatever. And the last bit, like get as you are comfortable, depending on who these people are, right? Try and give them as many options for getting in contact with you should something go wrong. Um, like be it your phone number, like a bunch of different email addresses that you always have open or whatever it may be, or Teams chat, just so you have the best shot. If something does happen, you'll still get them in the door, get data from them and have them kind of work with whatever product you're using. Yeah, great points. Thank you for the question, Michelle. Uh, this next one is going to be a little different from some of the other questions that we got, but we got it in our Discord. And I thought uh, this was an interesting one. Um, Blake, I hope you're well versed on on uh, standards. Hey, this one's from David in our Discord. Hey, quick question. Are there any standards on the brightness of LED status indicators? Oh, my goodness. There has to be so many. But knowing which ones are applicable to your situation would be very tough. Plus, the one thing I would imagine, too, is like there could end up being paywalls for some of this stuff for any kind of like st some standards that exist. But it looks like you came up with a fair amount of different solutions for them. Were there any that ended up helping uh, this particular Discord member out? I don't know. Good follow up for them. Uh, so I actually went through and uh, listed off the mill standard 1472H. We're on version revision H now. Um, and I think this is a good resource for anyone looking for standards. There's a lot of uh, good work that goes into these mill standards, lots of um, heavily researched uh, human factors behind the scenes, know some of the folks who actually put this together. Um, and so it's it's one of those things that it's freely available, right? So anyone in the world can download this. If they Google mill standard 1472 revision H, they can find it. Um, and it's chock full of everything you can possibly imagine. And so I pulled out a couple examples from uh, this standards. Uh, and, and it's a good starting point for, you know, if, if you can't, if you need an IEEE standard, hopefully your company will, will uh, get you on that one. Otherwise, you can say you adhere to this standard and it's at least something, right? So, um, you know, I pulled out a couple of uh, examples on here. So sections 5.17.26, it's called brightness coding. Perhaps uh, section 3.2.75 which is visible and visibility of displays. And then 3.2.76 visual display might have more info on these general display standards. I'm, I, I am curious to see if you know anyone else knows of any other standards out there that talk about specifically LED status indicators. But I just thought it was such a unique question and a good kind of time to mention that resource um, that again is free for anyone to download and has a lot of really good, solid human factors information in there ba based in science. And it's linked all together so you can see where, you know, it was derived from uh, and, you know, the logic is in there and everything. So it's, it's, a, it's a good read, I guess, if you're, you know, a, a human factors nerd. Uh, any, anything else on standards, Blake? I'd say one thing that might be worth us just chatting about for a second is if this comes up, what are some good places to go look for this kind of stuff or go try and find if there is anything um, related here? One obvious big hitter is, you know, using HFES and their website to try and figure out one, can you interact with anybody if you're a member that maybe knows this stuff or if there are kind of specific technical groups this might be involved in, depending on, you know, your domain of work. Um, but another great place that I've always kind of use sparingly is Google Scholar to figure out if there's any kind of good publications that I could either grab and take back to my company and say like, hey, these would be worth investigating for the problem we're dealing with. Or if depending on company you work at, if you have, you know, academic subscriptions, maybe you can track down and see, hey, does IEEE have this or whatever it may be. Um, but the power of Google searching can be really useful. Are there any good resources you know of for kind of finding this information or even just looking it up? I would start with uh, LED standards, just Googling it and and see what comes up, right? And that'll lead you down a rabbit hole. And I think uh, I usually start with the mill standard, if anything, because they, they send me in the direction of the research and I can find exactly where it came from and uh, kind of go down a rabbit hole that way if I need to investigate further, right? Absolutely. Um, so... 
All right, we got time for one more. Which one you want to do, Blake? Of these last three, you want to do one or three? That we didn't get to automotive and aerospace. Let's do that. All right, let's let's do that one. This is from Q K B R N F X J M S O V R I Z D G on the Human Factor subreddit. (laughs) I did not pick that because of that name. (laughs) Thanks, Blake. (laughs) This is automotive versus aerospace industry pros and cons. For people who have worked in either or both as a human factors professional, what are your thoughts? Which one is better for our profession? Which one is more fun and which one has better long-term job security? Blake, I'm curious what you think about the automotive versus aerospace industries. Yeah, so be prepared for like a full, a mouthful of bias coming from me because there's definitely one that I would be more interested (laughs) in. Um, But I have had a little bit of experience working in the aviation realm now, one one part that I can't answer to this question, and Nick, maybe you have a perspective on this, but which is better for our profession? I think that they equally bring different things to the table because from my perspective, I know aerospace has a long, long history in human factors. I mean, from cockpit design being the biggest one, right? Uh, but it definitely, AV, automation in cars right now is a big deal. And there's a lot of interesting spaces to, you know, evaluate from the design perspective, the research perspective. So auto automotive is going to be contributing and continue to contribute to the human factors world for a long time as well. Um, so I would say that both are equally awesome for the field, whether it's design or human factors, um, and which more, which one is more fun. Uh, the only one reason I would say potentially automotive might be more fun for me is because of my own basic bias there's a lot of really cool things going on in cars right now from the automation side but also from like these infotainment systems that from my experience are widely kind of unstandardized and there's a lot of different interesting interaction style problems that would be fun to work on there's a lot of different electric car companies that are being developed and their entire ecosystem and experience is not just the traditional car experience there's a lot of like applications that are now tied to cars as well. So the design space is huge. So for me, I'm I'm really excited about the implications of being a human factors and UX person in the automotive world. Because more and more, I think we're going to see it move kind of towards where aerospace is, where it's not going to be as much of an active experience as it is a passive experience. And so what are you going to do with all that time? What are the variables you have to, you know, account for if a safety issue happens? Why a you know, fully automated cars driving. There's just so many cool things that are going to happen in the automotive industry that I I would love to be a part of some of that stuff in my in the future part of my career. Long term job security. I would say that either one probably brings a lot of uh, you know job security in and of itself because both are going to be dealing with different levels of automation and eventually probably AI. Uh, so there's a lot going on there in terms of what's going to in in Aviation, I think there's like a different, a bunch of different paths you could end up taking, and it might be looking towards auto, you know, autonomous vehicles or things that are not necessarily driven by people, versus like working for Delta, if you say. Uh, but it, I don't know. It's probably not a great answer. I think both fields are awesome, and I, I definitely would like to work in either one of them again. Uh, but Nick, your perspective on automation or automotive and aerospace? Yeah. Do you want cookies or do you want cake? They're both great. Uh, I think, you know, there it's, you're neither is better for our profession. They're both great for our profession. Uh, and so like, I don't understand that question so much is, you know, that they're, they're both, they both offer their own, uh, unique advantages. Right. Um, I think in terms of fun, it depends on what you like. And I said, I said the thing, but it does, it it really, it depends on what you enjoy doing. Um, do you enjoy trailblazing? If so, you might find uh, that a, a lot of things from the automotive or surface transportation come from the aviation or aerospace industry. Uh, I feel like there's a lot uh, more at stake when it comes to um, getting things wrong in aerospace uh, than in automotive in terms of uh, you know time, research, human lives. Uh, it would, you know, I, I think human lives is debatable because there's more uh, automotive lives lost than 
uh, aerospace on an uh, annual average, but it kind of depends on uh, on what you think. If you want to save time and money for people, if you want to uh, then maybe go aerospace, if you want to save lives, then maybe go automotive. Uh, wh- what's more fun to you? Um, <laughs> in terms of long term job security, I'll tell you, both are going to be around for a very long time. Automotive people think of ending when the user uh, no longer drives, but that's not true because you still have to keep them in the loop of what's going on with these automated systems. It's going to be very much supervisory control for the people in these automated vehicles and surface transportation just in general is uh, a huge domain. And so you're, you're going to have to deal with still the, um, I mean, they're talking about specifically automotive. I'm going to expand that to surface transportation because you have things like uh, signs and messaging for um, cyclists or pedestrians. And that's huge too. Or, you know, communicating between the groups. How do you communicate from a vehicle to a bicycle? Or how do you communicate from a uh, cyclist to a pedestrian? There's a bunch of different uh, interesting communication things going on with, um, with surface transportation that I think is worth exploring. Uh, I think that's it, right? That's, that's it. Any other thoughts on that one, Blake? No, I, I do want to echo what you're saying, though. I mean, do what you think is interesting to you. And th- the answer is not going to be wrong in that case. Perfect. All right, let's get into this uh, last part of the show. One more thing. It doesn't need an introduction. It's where we talk about one more thing. Uh, Blake, what, what's your one more thing this week? Oh, man. So my one more thing is a sad one more thing. Mm. I am having one of the craziest experiences trying to get some technology to work and play nice together inside of like uh, so it's uh, it's audio equipment again so i'm using like a it's it's from a company called neural dsp and they have a c++ design i think c++ designed uh guitar plugin but there's some kind of conflict going on within with it and my current operating system for my Mac, which is, you know, running the M1 chip. And there's just threads and threads of information to go through. And when you brought up earlier in the show, the the kind of world of in- misinformation that we kind of find ourselves in, where you have to kind of make your own reality in some ways, uh, it's it's been an interesting route to go down rabbit holes in forums and all that kind of stuff that I feel like I haven't done since I was in high school. Uh, but that's, that's kind of all that's going on with me. Just troubleshooting silly things. How about you, man? What's going on in your world? Okay. Apologies for anyone who's around in the pre-show. Cause I'm going to say this again. Um, I found a door for my pod. Uh, anyone who's been listening to the show for a while, I'm building a pod for the pod, but also like a work office. Cause we're in a two bedroom apartment right now while we look for a home. And, uh, I needed the third bedroom. So I'm effectively building that third bedroom around me. Anyway, I built a pocket door here uh, to my right and it has some very unique dimensions. It's non-standard for a pocket door uh, and it's non-standard for a regular door. So I understood that going in that I would need to make some modifications to it. Now I was at Ikea the other day. We were looking for a chair for my wife's office and um, we found it. But then I also just happened to take a look at some of these large sheets of, uh, well, cardboard furniture is what people call it. But, uh, and, and lo and behold, I found a desktop, um, like a literal desktop, not like a computer that was the exact dimensions that I was looking for this door. So it's light enough to, you know, fit on a track and it's, um, sturdy enough to act as a door. So now I have an Ikea desktop (laughs) that's taking place of my, uh, this little void here that was that's behind this uh, little um, it's the word I'm looking for, like sound absorption pad uh, that, uh, it, you know, depends pad for sound. So uh, behind that is my pocket door. And I'm not going to pull this off because it's a it's a big thing. Anyway, for anyone listening, I found a pocket door at Ikea and it's cool and it fits and it's very serendipitous. So anyway nice. yeah especially <laughs> with the dimensions you were rattling off earlier it yeah. would have been impossible to figure out or find without doing it custom yeah all right well that's gonna be it for today everyone let us know what you guys think of the news story this week what do you think about aging do you think uh what do you wish would get better with age uh you can hang out with us on our slack or discord get to us on any of our social channels 
Visit our official website, sign up for our newsletter, stay up to date with all the latest Human Factors news. If you like what you hear, you want to support the show, there's a couple things you can do. One, right now, you can leave us a five-star review. That's free for you to do, and it really helps out the show. Two, tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is really important for helping us grow as a show, uh, helping other people find it. Three, if you're able to, consider supporting us on Patreon. Uh, We always appreciate the money, but we always put it right back into the show. We don't pocket any of that. Uh, It always goes to things like conference coverage or, you know, some of the tools that we use to help put this thing out there on a weekly basis. Uh, As always, links to all of our socials and website are in the description of this episode. I want to thank Mr. Blake Arnsdorf for being on the show today. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk about dementia? Oh, goodness. If you want to talk about dementia, you can always reach me in the Human Factors Cast Discord or Slack at Blake. Um, And then across social media at Don't Panic UX. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me streaming on Twitch every Monday evening at 4 p.m. And for office hours and across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning into Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it depends. It depends.